was actually Katie, but I'm asking it on her behalf. <laughs> um, the, the Singapore example, which you give, uh, extremely interesting, but Singapore really is a small place. It has a very limited population. It's been very careful to maintain that as a, their own population. Um, does uh, the idea of land control, which you describe and clearly relates to land value taxation, does that um, limit the size of the applicable situation? And how does that relate to the idea of a universal, new, universal view of nations? Th thank, thank you, Brian. So the, the question is about whether the unique size, if you like, uh, an urban population of Singapore makes, makes it different. To what extent can the principles be applied to other nations? Um, I accept that Singapore is a unique place and this uh, observation is often made when I talk about Singapore, people say, oh, well, Singapore's unique, you can't, it wouldn't work anywhere else, you know. Well, I, I refute that. I think the principles are universal. Um, if you look at, look at London, there are very high land values. Uh, some, some, for example, the Crown Estate are collected uh, for public revenue, and the Crown Estate is a very competent and... Um, astute developer, they maximise the value of the Crown Estate. For anyone who doesn't know, it's about 42 acres around Regent Street and Regent's Park. Um, the Apple Store on Regent Street pays more rent than the entire rural Crown Estate. And 75% of the Crown Estate's income goes to the Treasury. So, but equally, we have um, private landowners, Duke of Westminster, uh, who lives off the Grosvenor estate. Uh, all I'm suggesting is that he hands back the community-generated value from that estate for public revenue. So I, I think the, the principles would apply universally. Is there a question from the audience? Yes. I thought Singapore might be a model for us, but uh, the taxation is 31% of the personal tax, isn't it? If you add up the sales tax, the income tax, and the car tax, it comes to 31% according to, to your list. Um, and you've also mentioned that there's tremendous inequality in Singapore. Yeah. Um, so what can we learn from Singapore? Uh, they have a... Well, the question is, um, there are still high personal taxes, um, this really, this in Singapore and um, why is that, if I understand you correctly? Well, I, I thought the, the idea of land value, land well, tax, this you call it, was to do away with other taxes. Yeah, this lecture isn't really about land value tax. Oh, okay. It's about how to share uh, collectively created value and Singapore is just one example. And it, it's, the, the lecture really w was to convince you that there is something called the commons and it, it, the way it can be applied in the 21st century is to collect some of that collectively created value as public revenue by whatever means. Singapore is doing it in one way. It's not, mainly, maybe not the best way, which I've hinted at, um, but there it is. It's, it's the probably, in my view, the best example of collecting a high percentage of that publicly created value. It's not a strict land value tax. So I hope that answers your question. It does. It's just that if they own 90% of the land and personal taxation comes to 31%, it, does, it, 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 it weakens the argument. Uh, well, it, I, I'm not in charge of Singapore. I can't... No, no, <laughs> I know, but we're presumably looking at Singapore <coughs> to see how it might be applied here. It, how the principles might yes, be applied. Yes. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not advocating 
a transplant of Singapore's tax system uh, to the UK. The other thing to bear in mind, the, the so-called salaries tax, personal income tax, is paid by only about 17% of the population. There are very high thresholds before you start paying personal taxes. Um, online we have uh, Robin, if you like. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm very struck by the stark contrast between the debt-encumbered UK economy and the asset-rich Singapore economy. Yet in both cases, there are extreme examples of inequality. Um, you've referenced foreign workers having a very uh, limited rights, perhaps needing a better conditionality in sharing the prosperity. But uh, it seems the UK government um, uses unemployment or um, creating uh, situations where wages are restricted, where uh, people have to survive on benefits rather than distribute wealth. Where in Singapore, is there a system of distributing the wealth to those people who are less advantaged? Yeah, so the question really is about whether Singapore has a system of redistribution of, of wealth. Yes. It, it's, it, it's not as well developed as it is here in the UK. One mm -hmm. of Lee Kuan Yew's uh, principles was self-reliance. He would rather individual effort, family help, and only as a last resort, state help. That is beginning to change. Uh, there is 10 years, I think, um, free education for all Singaporeans, citizens that is. Um, access to healthcare is, is quite good, is subsidised. There is a, I didn't talk about their Central Provident Fund, which is a private pension system, um, which every, every Singaporean citizen is obliged to contribute to. Employer contributions are also made. So, uh, and the other th thing, of course, housing. The Housing Development Board, 80% of the population live in public housing. Um, the majority of those are owners. There are about 6% who rent. And prices and rents are heavily subsidised. So if you are on a low income, you still have access to decent housing. The uh, housing price to income ratio in Singapore is five, and it's, it's deliberately held at that level through increasing subsidies as necessary. Whereas in the UK, I think it's now reached, um, I can't, I'm not sure whether there are eight or 12, but in London, it's approaching 19. Which is, which is what makes housing so unaffordable. So it's, um, it's a slightly different system, not as generous perhaps as in the UK, but nonetheless, um, quite a bit of help is given for people on lower incomes, people less capable of working, uh, but it is very different from the European model. Back to the room, any? Thank you for the answer. May I just add something? Do you uh, believe or think that a dividend from the increase in land value, the collective um, uh, prosperity, um, paid universally, would assist? Uh, well, we, we do have a uh, universal dividend in this country already. It's called the pension. It's just um, <laughs> controlled by one's <laughs> age. So I, I don't see any reason why that uh, concept couldn't be extended to mm. a larger percentage of the population. And paid for from the collective From the, from the collective value, which is, which is yeah. how our uh, pension system in the UK is, is paid for. Um, its okay. Current work is used to pay the pensions. When you said 17% of, the, sorry, when you said 17% of the population 
base tax, is that the working population or is that the percentage of the, the country? Is uh, a big difference? People in work. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 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 So in other words, it's it's really only the high earners who pay uh, personal taxes. Uh, back to, who is it on? Patrick. Hello, Andrew. Uh, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm intrigued really about the. I've also read your book on Hong Kong, by the way. Uh, and I just wondered one thing I wondered there's an A and a B to two questions here, really. But uh, the first one is from your studies of Hong Kong and Singapore, can you see any <coughs> areas there, measures there that could be introduced to the UK? land system to for the benefit of all or is it just too big a question to answer uh, and the second part of the question is to do with stamp duty because you mentioned in your talk the high cost of property particularly in london and one thing that would affect that would be stamp duty at the circuit level i think did you say 30 percent in singapore and now gone up to 60 percent which is absolutely massive compared to even uh, the higher rate of applying to non-residents in London at present time. So those are my questions, really. Thank uh, you. Okay. So the questions are whether any of the uh, practices in Singapore could be brought back to the UK, and the second part related to stamp duty. Uh, the the 60%, just to be clear, is the additional overseas buyer stamp duty. So yeah. the stamp duties on for you know your your first purchase in Singapore are much lower. Um, just to comment on stamp duties, it's it's not the best form of uh, controlling house prices, um, and and that's what it is. If you if you apply uh, a stamp duty to the purchase of a home, it reduces what you can afford to pay for the home. Uh, if you increase the stamp duty, of course, it just reduces further what you can borrow to buy a, p a property or, or what, what you can afford in terms of buying a property. So a much better way of, if you want to collect a tax on property, uh, would be an annual tax on the rental value. And of course, I would argue even better if it relates to land, land value only. Um, are there, are there any... Sorry, uh, I, I possibly didn't uh, clarify. On the stamp duty question, it was really related to uh, foreign buyers, which yeah. are a very big part of the London market uh, and drive, no doubt, drive prices up. Uh, yes. I just put it in relation to foreign buyers, not, not indigenous buyers. Yes. Um, well, we have in, in the UK differential stamp duty for second homes. I'm not sure, I've, I can't recall now whether foreign buyers also pay a higher rate. I don't know if anybody can, uh, but it, but, but, but that, that, I, I think the last time I looked at it, I think it was 15% they paid. Uh, right. So that, uh, I think that was introduced by George Osborne, but I'm not sure what's happened recently. No, but it, that, that could be increased further if one wanted to discourage um, foreign owners from buying property in London and those who live in London are all too familiar with the empty towers, mm -hmm. the, the more expensive the development, the higher the proportion of foreign ownership, uh, which are, there are no lights, that's how you can tell that nobody lives there. Mm -hmm. um, the first question, could we, we apply the same principles uh, in, in the UK, yes, one th reform that I believe would have to uh, take place would be a clarification or a, uh, a new compulsory purchase act that would remove hope value from what local authorities would need to pay if they wish to purchase land for public purpose. Uh, that it did it didn't exist in the original act, but it was challenged by landowners and the, the idea, it was accepted that hope value ought to be paid. This is the interesting thing that 
the Land Acquisition Act in Singapore did, it ruled out any legal challenge to the principle of public uh, land acquisition for any public purpose. And it removed the whole question of how much should be paid to a tribunal. Uh, it also passed, the government also passed local ordinances to limit the amount that would be paid to historic valuations. So for, for that, those first decades of public purchase of land, landowners got less than current value. In 2007, I think, finally, the, la the a new Land Acquisition Act amendment accepted that market value should be paid, but thankfully 90% of the land had been purchased by that time. Um, Lee Kuan Yew described uh, this process in, in a speech once. Mm -hmm. He said it, it was Robin Hood, so he knew what he was <laughs> doing, uh, but it, it did give the opportunity for the vast majority of Singaporeans, over 90%, uh, own their own property, live in their own homes. Uh, so it, it achieved its purpose, even though it, um, in, in Western, the Western idea of property ownership, uh, people were dispossessed of some of that value. Back to the room, yes? Um, so the question is whether the 5% the increase in Singapore's population over the last 12-18 uh, months a year, whether that's sustainable. Um, I, would, I would say yes. Uh, I think both on the island itself, uh, but perhaps um, greater cooperation with, the, with Malaysia there's still quite a lot of needle between Singapore and Malaysia, but a lot of companies now have developed offices in Johor Bahru, which is just over the causeway. You, you know, you, it's, a, it's a narrow strip of water. Uh, more and more people commute on a daily basis. Uh, transport links could be improved. There are neighboring islands a little further away uh, Pulau, I think, is perhaps the nearest, relatively undeveloped. So th there is potential for more development, both on the island and in the, some of the neighbouring uh, territory. But it would, it would require Singapore and Malaysia to bury the hatchet, as it were. Online, who do we have? Ainsley? If you'd like to unmute... Can you hear us? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I can hear you now. Yep. Um, you, you have mentioned that um, the, the leasing of land in Singapore, after it coming to its 199-year lease, it did not have the value as, as what they expected. And you have um, some papers on that. So can you shed more on that, please? Yes. So the question is about uh, the fixed-term leases, 99 years. So all leases after independence were issued on a fixed term 99 year basis and um, they were offered at auction and the arrangement was a, an upfront premium. Eric Larange, who I mentioned, did recommend a ground rent as well as an upfront premium, but the ground rent idea was dropped. Uh, so the, the value that anybody would pay for a lease to develop a plot of land uh, will have a value at the start of the 99-year uh, period for that you have the right to use that land. Maybe take two or three years to develop the building, then you can rent it out, sell it, whatever you do, and that generates an income which determines the value of that piece of land or that building combination. As the lease term runs down, of course, not only does the 
quality of the building deteriorate, it needs major refurbishment every so often, which costs money, but also the, the long-term income stream has a cut-off date, and the value of that income stream is what determines the, um, the capital value, the day, you know, on the day value of any building uh, or a, a piece of land, and it's, it's that value which is falling as you get closer to the end of the lease term. Just to reflect one way that could redress this problem of falling lease values, in Hong Kong, again for particular historical reasons, the new territories which were leased from China in 1898 for a term of 99 years, the government in Hong Kong offered 75 plus 75 year leases. So in the 1970s, um, they were coming up to, re you know, could they renew the lease? And it was clear by the 1970s that no, they could not offer a lease renewal because China was not going to offer a lease extension to the UK. So instead of renewing leases after 75 years, so in contract it was 75 plus 75 years, instead of taking another upfront premium and renewing for 75 years, they simply rolled over the first 75 years into a perpetual lease, but introduced a new uh, variable so-called crown rent, now a government rent, 3% of rateable value. So more and more land as, uh, or lease, more and more leases in Hong Kong as the lease terms expire are transferring to this concept perpetual lease and at a 3% per annum uh, charge, government rent, which is, um, there's a, an annual revaluation, so it moves up and down with the strength of the economy. So that, that would be one way for the Singapore government to overcome the political opposition to lease expiry, and it would also provide a more sustainable, uh, more regular income. Instead of upfront premiums for another 99 years, it would be an annual 3%, 30%, whatever percentage of the um, land value or property value is, is chosen. So I hope that answers your question. Oh yes, yes it did. And um, yes, your books, how many books do you got? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And your books, yeah, yep. if you have all those in your books, that would be really great. Yeah, you can read more about it in, in that uh, first book. Oh. Oh, uh, okay. Which one is that, the title of it? Uh, no Debt, Low Tax, uh, High Growth, I think. I, it may have been, um, well, we, we could send you a link afterwards. Okay, thank you very okay. much. Okay. Cheers. Ian. Uh, <coughs> Andrew, you mentioned there's um, very little free speech. Um, does that uh, relate to any of these policies and does it mean you've got a, a one-party state in Singapore? Uh, the, it's not one-party state but the same party has been in power since independence. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're very astute at reading the room, reading the nation. Um, famously in the 2011 election, the, it, the polls were suggesting that the opposition parties would make a big inroad and the um, Li Sien Lung, who was, is the son of Li Kuan Yew, who was Prime Minister, before the election day, he, in a talk, he p apologised for the poor performance of the Singapore government and promised to do better. Uh, and although the opposition parties, I think, gained about 20% of the vote, um, the People's Action Party still got the majority of, of seats. So it, there is an opposition, and uh, there are, they have an interesting uh, additional appointment of certain MPs, so they pick interesting people in civil society to sit in Parliament, um, who are not necessarily politically affiliated. So that 
uh, and things are changing. Um, rules, for example, uh, homosexuality is no longer, although on the statute book it is still illegal, it's been made clear that nobody is going to be prosecuted and, uh, and it, I think it's now the government have said that that statute will be repealed, for example. The, I didn't mention that if there is a barrier to housing purchase, you have to be married. Again, uh, th those kind of restrictions, there is talk of um, you know, re reducing barriers to property ownership, allowing single people to purchase, and so on. Is there a draconian punishment in Singapore? For um, drug smuggling, dealing, yes. I think they still have capital punishment. And, you know, famously, you're not, you're not allowed to chew gum. Well, I, I'm not sure how accurate that is. <laughs> but you can get whipped for certain <coughs> misdemeanours. Um, but it's not, I don't think it's very common. I think we're up to time, so maybe this is a good... So there's one more question, perhaps, at the back. Oh, From Peter. Peter. Yep. Um, given that only 83% of the population pay income tax and there's highly subsidised housing, what's life like for the average Singaporean? Um, I mean, I, th I think it's fair to say the original housing development, public housing was uh, put up very quickly, uh, is perhaps by today's standards relatively poor, although they have got upgrading programs. Uh, my brother owned an HDB property which he was able to reconfigure. It was in a very central location, um, very clean, very nice neighbours, I mean um, I perhaps can't go into too much detail, but for the you know transport system is is very good. There's plenty of employment. If you're if you're prepared to work, uh, you can have a good life in Singapore. Edu education is readily available for your children. Sponsorship for secondary education, you know, sixth form or university if you're bright. Uh, sponsorship for overseas. Um, courses, master's courses, PhDs. You know, the, the public realm is, is, is fantastic. Huge amounts spent on um, the public realm, the roads, plant, tree planting, clean water. Um, so I, I would say it may be slightly dull, um, you know, not as vibrant as some cities. Certainly Hong Kong is, is more vibrant. But th again, that's changing. Uh, they're trying to encourage a, a sort of younger outlook, people with, uh, you know, tech skills, and they're having to cater for more tastes. So, uh, you know, if, if you're prepared to work hard, life in Singapore is pretty good. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Andrew, I'd note the late question online. If there are any other questions, perhaps you could email them in and maybe we'll get an answer from Andrew. Anyway, Andrew, thank you very much indeed. And I think we just... <laughs>